It Happened on the Mysterious Isle of Seacliff by Ian Gordon. Eight, the house on Silver Street. December twenty ninth, eight thirty a.m. I slept soundly last night, undisturbed by the critters or by anything else that might have gone bump in the night. Awakening to the gentle knocking of Miss Black, I answered the door and was once again thrilled to discover a cooked breakfast on a serving cart. The meal, consisting of the same ingredients was delicious, and the coffee, though still unusual with hints of aniseed, was much more palatable. Perhaps I'm becoming accustomed to it. I have to mention this ears business again, though. The skin directly to the rear of my ears is incredibly tender. I wonder if there's something in the fabric softener used here at the pub that's irritating my skin. That aside, I'm about ready to return to Silver Street. I'm fairly reluctant to do so, but it's a necessary evil. Far too many questions. I need answers. It's bitterly cold outside. The frost on the square this morning is testament to the fact. I'll have to wrap up warm. More later. December 29th, 2.15 p.m. Where do I begin? Some things are easy to document the facts concerning my arrival, the back and forth throughout Redditch, my rendezvous with the Seven Sisters, but the details pertaining to my Silver Street visit this morning aren't quite so straightforward. As expected, the chill was biting when I left the pub. It had me moving at a brisk pace. Into the northern lanes I headed, trying to retrace my steps of the day before. It wasn't too challenging— the attractive facade of the Red House on Cook's Row, and the impressive crooked spire of an ancient tower on Queen Street were enough to assist me in my recollection of the route. Again, I was taken by the serenity of the streets. Although the properties in the district were well kept and clearly inhabited, there wasn't a soul in sight. Where was everybody? What were they up to? Were they strolling the beach with pets in tow? fostering the broad heaths, or were they conducting secret rituals in shadowy lofts and basements? It was difficult to dismiss any possibility, given what I'd witnessed on the Isle of Seacliff thus far. Soon enough, though, I reached the dreaded junction, and gazed upon Silver Street, appraising the faded frontages and sinister portals. Not one to hesitate, in most cases anyway. I stepped onto the grey lane, overwhelmed by the raging sense of familiarity that was coursing through my veins. I had walked that street before. The fact was undeniable. But when, and under what circumstances? It was clear that the street was uninhabited. Not a single dwelling appeared to house anything other than pigeons and vermin. Nearing the end of the cul-de-sac, my eyes fell upon one of several four-story townhouses, number 33, one of only a few whose door remained intact. I was taken by the flaking blue paint, the distinctive sash windows, and the glorious, if mossy, portico surrounding the dull cobalt door. How did I know this place? I was reasonably sure I hadn't dreamt of it. The question buzzed around inside my head, looking for a place to land. I had little choice but to enter the house. Climbing the grubby steps, accessed directly from the overgrown path, I approached the knackered door and tried the rusty knob. Unsurprisingly, it was unlocked. Nervously, but still without hesitation, I pushed open the door and stepped inside. The smell of damp was tremendous. I was quick to pull my scarf up around my face. The last thing I needed was a lung full of spores. The interior, grand as it was, was almost entirely free of furnishings. Several items remained in the lounge, 
a rotten sofa, a Welsh dresser, and what might have once passed for television, now just an empty wooden box full of bulbous mushrooms. I passed into the rear of the property, determined to scratch the familiar itch, and then I saw it, on the mantelpiece in what was probably once the dining room. I spotted a photograph in a heavily stained frame. I collected the picture, and brushed away the decades of dust and grime. I was taken aback by what I saw there. There were four individuals staring back at me, photographed outside that very house, number 33, Silver Street. The two adults I recognized instantly. They were my parents, James and Lou Howarth. The boys with them, some seven or eight years old, both resembled me. Had I a twin? I had never seen a photograph of myself quite so young, nor had I ever seen my parents quite so young, to tell the truth. I knew my parents had relocated from North Yorkshire to Berkshire when I was just a lad, but I had never been able to recall much about it. My childhood memories consist almost exclusively of long summers in the Downs and cold winters in Bucklebury, but I might have originated here, on the Isle of Seacliff, is a shocking revelation to me. Is that why the elders of Redditch seem to recognize me? Did they know that I would eventually return? That my return was somehow heralded by the imminent reappearance of the sleeping king? I know, from discussions with my father in his later years, that we arrived in Berkshire in the spring of 1941. If that's true, then my parents and I were living on the Isle fifty years ago, when the sleeping king was rumoured to have last emerged. The winter he fed poorly, according to old Mr. Johnston. Was that one of the reasons we left? But what of the other boy in the photograph? The boy who looks just like me? I never had a brother. It was only the three of us, myself, my mother, and my father. No extended family whatsoever. Dumbfounded, I made my slow, contemplative way back to the pub. And here I am, back in my suite, the fifty-year-old picture in front of me. The photograph is faded and improperly focused, but there are undoubtedly two boys standing there with my parents. What does it mean? I feel as though the obvious thing to do at this juncture is to ask around, perhaps beginning with the mysterious Catherine, if I can locate her, and I'm sure Mr. Johnson would be up for another natter. It's all so bizarre. The whole thing has me on edge. But I have to know. If there's anybody on this island who remembers my parents, then it's in my interest to seek them out. I think I'm going to close my eyes for twenty minutes. I have a lot to process here. Thanks for listening today, folks. Join us again tomorrow for the next part.